Right, so this isn't my usual sort of content, but bear with me. I'm something of a physics nerd, so I at least have some authority here on my topic. So let's get started. And we start off with a very basic concept, distance, the space between two points. Simple, right? Well, not necessarily. It's very intuitive, yes. But part of that intuition can come into problems. For example, we all know what time is, right? Thing is, sometimes our assumptions are wrong, so we need to re-examine things, etc. That's what special relativity is, after all. Re-examining what we think of in space and time. That's velocity. It's change in distance over time in a specific direction. That last part is important. important. Speed is just change in distance over time. Velocity is a value with a direction. It's called a vector value. Vectors are basically arrows with a direction and a magnitude, or a, which is basically how long they are. They can come with dimensions in order to specify which direction they go. For example, a diagonal arrow to the upper left corner would have a magnitude in the up direction and well, the other direction. Was it left or right that I said? Well, that specific direction too. Of course, the zero value has no direction. And that is displacement. It's the total distance traveled between um, from a starting point to an end point. In this case, from the point where Orange landed to the point where he is now. And now, and now. Acceleration. That happens to be the change in speed. If it's constant, then speed will constantly increase. Though in this case, he's not particularly capable of doing that. Below that was friction, which is an opposing force to stop things moving. And that is mass. Everything has a mass. Though it may be zero. That is, uh, is it Newton's first law? Or was it the second? Either way, F equals MA. Forces, mass times acceleration. It also happens to be a vector quantity, or can be a vector quantity. Work is force times displacement. So, since, or, well, not necessarily displacement, it's, okay, so, it's based on vector quantities again, so if you happen to be lifting something up, you're putting force in the direction that it's moving, so that's work. If you're carrying something as you walk, it's not work because the two directions are perpendicular. That was Newton's third law for a second there. With every action comes an equal and opposite reaction on the opposing object. So whenever it hits the ground, it gets an equal force from the ground, causing it to bounce back up. Power is work over time. This one's a bit more complex. So it hits the ground at 512 newtons with two force vectors, which can be divided into the cosine and the sine. After all, it's an ang it hits the ground at an angle, so. And it goes up to 12.8 meters, and the cosine section of the force shifts due to the force of gravity. It constantly it constantly gets pulled down. Although in this case, really, it, hmm, I'm not sure if force would be the best option here, but... Uh. It hits the ground at 128 newtons, so it lost some energy there. This is an example of a collision that is not perfectly elastic. 
Elasticity is the concept of how much energy gets conserved by the hitting object. A perfectly elastic object will bounce forever, whereas a perfectly... Well, there's an elasticity. Yeah, an elastic collision will bounce forever, whereas a perfectly elastic collision would just consume as much all the energy it can away from movement. No collision is perfectly inelastic. In fact, some of the energy is lost by the sound of the ball hitting the ground. Another point of friction is that how strong friction is dependent on the well, the friction constant of the surface. I don't quite remember what the name is. On the ice, it's a lot lower. And those were a bunch of force vectors of the forces on its legs. I don't think the point one is very accurate here because he's not moving at all, but... Rope hits the ground at two newtons. <laughs> Angular momentum is equal to mvr, so mass times velocity times radius. If you have it consistently, and well, P happens to be momentum here. And given no friction, a rotating object like this will persist. This is how gyroscopes work. And you can convert that to linear momentum. The large ball has about four times his mass, so the momentum is, for the most part, well, the transfer velocity is, in the absence of elasticity, it would be two meters per second, but here, because the collision is elastic, it wasn't quite two meters, plus friction, which Orange apparently can't seem to really get into, but... <laughs> Kinetic energy and potential energy. Kinetic energy is one half mv squared, whereas potential energy, due to the gravitational field, to be precise, is mgh. So m is mass, v is velocity, g is acceleration to gravity, and h is the height change, where height is defined as away from the mass of that you're getting pulled towards by gravity. Those little errors there are the force due to the tension of the rope. Orange here starts with not enough potential energy to get up to the other side, so he slides all the way back. And pulls on the rope again. This time he has extra kinetic energy, so he makes it to the top with momentum to spare. That is a rocket. That's torque. Torque is a combination of the radius vector and the force vector. Well, multiplied, not added. And it's a vector multiplication, so that's a very specific definition. 
since the force is constant here, well, F2 is constant here, F1 is dependent on the combination, well, is affected by the radius, and F2. As the radius decreases, F1 increases, allowing him to launch very, very far up. Enough to hit escape velocity of the planet. Allowing him to leave the gravity well. Thrust is a change in mass over time that is created by rockets. That's pretty much it. Um, this is not how rockets really work here. The rocket's apparently generating mass out of thin air <laughs> constantly and pushing it outwards. Real rockets would have changing quantities of thrust. However, this rocket seems to have a constant acceleration. Up until he kicks it again. That's the Lorentz factor. C happens to be the speed of light in a vacuum. Beta is the per percentage of the speed of light. At 98 meters per second, it's a very small number. And gamma is the Lorentz factor. It's the effects that your speed has on relativistic effects, basically. It's how strong relativistic effects are due to your speed. And it increases dramatically as you approach C. But it's barely anything at half C. If it, it hits 2 at around 0.85 C, but then it hits 3 at about 0.93, 4 at about 0.96, 5 at a 0.98, and it just increases ad infinitum. It's an asymptote for those that know their mathematics. The Lorentz factor hits infinity at C. Slow is boring, isn't it? Space is dark. Very dark. Waves can bend around an object. This is called the wavefront. That's how reflections work. The normal is not would not be straight up here. It would actually be more of a line like this. Based, it's the perpendicular line to the surface, and the, since the surface isn't flat like this, the normal should actually be around here. But the two angles, but the incident angle and the reflected angle are the same. It is around the normal. The different colors of light are different wavelengths. White light is a combination of all wavelengths we can see. That's a gravity assist. What this does is that it steals a small amount of a larger body's momentum in order to boost your own. The effect is minimal to the massive object, but very strong to the small object. It's calculated by this complex equation, but we've used this often with space missions, so it's definitely a proven concept. At this distance, anything living normally would be fried, but oh well. Also, stars are incredibly massive. This would not work <laughs> at all. <laughs> stars do have an atmosphere. In fact, the atmosphere happens to be hotter than the surface itself.
but solo gravity is incredibly strong. If you can't manage to get a gravity assist off of them, you're going to get a lot of speed. But stars, stars tend to have minimal movement compared to planets. Do they? Actually, no, but it would have to be relative to the galactic center. They do move very fast, but relative to the galactic center. So it's less noticeable because of the sheer distances involved. The sun moves at about... Well, okay, I probably shouldn't have the video playing. The sun moves at about 14 kilometers per second, which is faster than any of those planets shown except for the closest one. But we wouldn't be able to use it for a launch from Earth, simply because we are not moving that fast, because our movement is relative to the Sun, not to the Earth, not to the galactic center. And we can only really use that effectively. That's how the magnetic field works. This, these equations here are the Maxwell field equations for the magnetic field. with along well these two up here that's how the magnetic field is calculated force current induction um i do know that i is induction but i don't actually remember what all these terms are this is magnetic permissivity of the vacuum though i believe Yeah, those are solenoids. And this is the equation for magnetic flux. Not solenoids. They're ring magnets. And that's the induction method. That's how you can create a magnet using another magnet. Atoms are tiny little magnets thanks to their electric field. And if they all happen to align, you get a magnet. That's a solenoid. It allows you to improve the strength of the magnetic field due to constant, closely compressed magnetic items. In other words, it compresses the field. And here, magnetic flux is used to boost the rocket's speed by applying a force. A very heavy force for a very short period of time. At these speeds, you start to get the Doppler effect occurring. Star system, asteroid field. Just so you know, asteroids are objects that, well, stars glow, because they're fusing gas, planets orbit stars and are large and spherical, microplanets aren't able to clear out their neighborhoods of most forms of debris, moons orbit planets, and asteroids are objects that are solid objects that are too small, well, solid rocky objects that are too small to be spherical. Comets are ice balls or rocky, well, yeah, they're ice balls that lose material as they get closer to the sun. Nebula are massive spaces of gas. At high speeds, you start to get time dilation, as well as space dilation. This is all a, an effect of a combination of Newtonian physics and Maxwell field equations. The Maxwell field equation stipulates that the speed of light is constant. It's always the same speed, at least in a vacuum. Which caused some con conniption between in classical physics because, well, if you were moving, if you had a moving light, well, 
source, if you had a moving light source, shouldn't light that is emitted in the direction of that light source be going faster to a stationary observer? In order to prevent this from occurring, so that light is always the same speed for an observer, space and time dilation occur. These are two galaxies. This is a spiral galaxy type SA. There's a galactic bulge in the center. Well, there's a, yeah, a bulge in the center uh, full of old stars with the center itself containing a black hole, probably. As far as we know, all galaxies have black holes in the center. There is a thick disk and a thin disk that spirals outward. This is where most star formation occurs. There's also globular clusters, which are also like the galactic bulge, several old stars that happen to be closely attached to the galaxy, but aren't a part of it. This is a galaxy with an active galactic center. The black hole consumes large quantities of materials, so much so that it creates massive relativistic jets. These occur because of the magnetic field of the black hole and move at close to the speed of light, very close. Eventually, this magnetic field weakens enough so that stuff starts to spread out because um, trajectories cannot be perfect, basically. You can't have a perfectly focused beam. And the further something goes out, the more it spaces out. Like a flashlight, if you point it very close to a wall, it's a small circle. As you move away, the circle gets bigger. The same thing happens, except it's less a flashlight and more like a sniper rifle with how accurate it is. The magnetic field is sort of like rifling in that it keeps it centered. However, when it gets weak, it spaces out dramatically into a radio lobe. It's not visible along the main image, but here it is. The active galactic nucleus, the, ga the name for such a galaxy, depends on how you look at it. Quasar is an angled view, while a blazar is directly at you. There's a third type that I don't remember and is not mentioned here. But it's a sideways view. Yep, Doppler effect. At high speeds, relative to the speed of a wave, oncoming waves are blue shifted and outgoing waves are red, well, red shifted. This is because you're hitting the waves faster in the direction of travel and slower in the direction away from travel. You can actually hear this effect from an ambulance move well from cars, vehicles, etc. They're actually moving relatively fast or decently fast compared to the speed of sound. So as they approach you, the pitch is higher because you're hitting more waves because the source itself is moving. And as it moves away, the pitch goes lower. The accretion disk is the mass going around a black hole and is slowly falling inwards. Time dilation, are, well, there are two actual forms of space and time dilation. There are those from speed, which are described in special relativity, and those from gravity, which are described in general relativity. Dilation gets extreme at high speeds. The Lorentz factor is almost 10 at 99% the speed of light. This is the accretion disk. And that's the event horizon on the black hole. The singularity is in the center of this. And because gravity is so strong here, it easily bends the light. So this bright spot over here is the other, is the far side of the accretion disk. You're seeing it because of the lensing effect of the black hole. The Doppler beaming. I don't actually know what that is. I've never seen that before. <laughs> Probably has something to do with the Doppler effect because of gas spinning so quickly around here. The photon ring is just outside the event horizon. It's the point, it's a shell of photons that are orbiting the black hole many, many times. 
After all, the event horizon is the point at which you would need to move at the speed of light in order to orbit the black hole. So just so at and just above it, just a tiny distance above it, is the photon ring because photons need to move orbit many, many times. At the event horizon, they orbit an infinite number of times. Just outside of it, they orbit many, many times before eventually escaping. Unless they happen to have the trajectory intersect with the event horizon at which they fall in. Gravitational redshift also occurs around black holes, just as speed redshift occurs. You probably shouldn't do this in real life. <laughs> Due to the effects of gravitational redshift, weird things happen around black holes, and what exactly happens to someone falling in depends on the perspective. From the outside perspective, time slows down to a standstill, and the object gets redshifted more and more until it vanishes to darkness. It also stretches out across the event horizon. The inner perspective is entirely different. The event horizon isn't actually a boundary, not for someone crossing it. It's a boundary for the outside. Once you cross it, the rest of the universe appears behind you and gets redshifted as you see the entire history of the universe play out and slowly gets smaller and smaller until you cannot see it anymore due to all the redshift. And as you fall in, gravity continuously increases. Gravitational pulse. Um, gravity waves are generated, and these can actually leave black holes. That's spaghettification. These are due to something called tidal forces. Because gravity is of different strength depending on the distance, gravity causes a slight stretching effect under normal circumstances. It's what cause it, they're called tidal forces because they cause the tides around the planet due to the effects of the moon's gravity. Inside of a black hole, things become dramatic because of the short distances involved with the mass, the uh, massive amounts of mass, it becomes very noticeable. There are in, as far as we know, because anything involving the insides of black holes are speculative, and based on physics that may not even be correct under those circumstances. There are two horizons. The outer horizon is the horizon everyone knows, the point of no return. Under certain circumstances, the black hole singularity can create a repulsive effect. It can either be charge, or, thanks to rotation, although charge would have weird effects. A positively charged black hole will have an inner horizon for positively charged particles or objects, but will continue will pull in negatively charged objects even further, which will also start to cancel out the charge. Yeah, angular momentum it makes much more sense. It allows for a space that acts normal, but with a with the oddities of a singularity. I'm not going to comment on this bit because I don't know. This is the first time I've seen something like this, so I'm not sure if the stretching occurs. That is the shape of an electron orbital. Specifically, the cloud that it forms. Um, 
Electrons don't really orbit in the nucleus like one would expect a planet around stars. Instead, they smear out in a probability cloud of a specific shape. And when you observe it, it's going to be somewhere within that cloud. And the denser the cloud is, the more likely, in a spot, the more likely you'll find it at that spot. At the proton, protons, as well as other baryons. They're called baryons, right? Yes. Yes, I think so. Are made of quarks. Protons are made of two up quarks and a down quark. Up quarks have a charge of plus two thirds, while down quarks have a charge of minus one third. This gives you a proton of charge plus one. Also, because of quantum effects, quarks have color charges of red, green, and blue. A photon is about to interact with an up quark, creating temporarily an anti quark of. Yeah, generating more photons. An anti green anti quark. The colors are just for easiness. World cheats are. Okay, it's probably better to explain them in a moment. Okay, we've got a few terms here. So, a conformal field is specifically a field in which angles are conserved. So, if you rotate it, if you rotate everything, then all angles are conserved. Normal space acts like this. The ant and normal space is three plus one dimensions. Three space dimensions plus a time dimension. That's one of the insights of general relativity and how it works. anti sitter space is, well, 5D anti sitter space. That's gonna take a bit more explaining. So imagine a 2D space, flat surface. You can curve it, after all, by pushing on it. And curve, and this curvature can be described, uh, well, inside a third dimension as well as within the other two dimensions. So in order to fully describe all any and all possible curvatures inside of a two-dimensional conformal space, you would need one dimension of anti de Sitter space. In order to describe a four-dimensional conformal space, all possible curvature, you would need five dimensions due to the sheer quantity of possibilities. As for what exactly anti sitter space is, um, it's a specific sort of hyperbolic geometry that has positive curvature? No, negative curvature. Anything more would, be, would take a one. A ward line is the line that a specific particle traces inside of a, well, a set of space dimensions plus a time dimension. The time dimension, after all, allows you to trace the whole path of a particle, and that gets you a ward line. A world sheet would be a one-dimensional object, so a line, and the path it traces through space-time. So if you have space, along this dimension, time along this dimension. A world line for, so if I move like this, the world line would be this line that the cursor is tracing. A world sheet would look something like this because of the fact that it's a larger object with multiple dimensions. The singularity. A singularity, actually, the term actually comes from mathematics. It's a point where something hits infinity and generally means that something interesting is going on and physicists before the discovery of black holes generally took this to scene you put something in wrong into the equation wrong this is a penrose diagram and is another point where the video is actually kind of wrong this shows this is a way to describe how black holes work. These lines right here are, are the event horizon. This is the universe itself, with up and down being time and left and right being space. 
in order to describe how exactly this works, so there's a concept called light codes. In any point of space, there are specific, because nothing can move faster than the speed of light, you can see everything, so if you were at this middle point, you could see everything that goes back along this light cone. So you can see anything goes on in this space, but not anything here. As you move upwards though, this past light cone expands. So you can now, so while you were here, you can only see this, you can't see anything here, but as time went on and you got to here, you can now see the stuff that's inside of this cone. So you get to see more. There's also a future light cone, which defines what you can interact with. So you can interact with anything up here. So as you move up to here, you can no longer interact with anything here. As you get closer to the black hole, your light cone contains more and more of the future singularity. Once you enter the black hole itself, all future light cones contain the black hole, the singularity. So you, once you enter the black hole, it is impossible not to get the singularity at some point. As you can see by the path that Orange is tracing here, he's doing impossible movements. Any movement that takes you within a light cone, within your light cone, is considered a time-like movement. Anything that takes you outside of the light cones are space-like movements. He's making a space-like movement this way and backwards in time. That is a probability wave. Probably the That's probably the best view for that. Probability waves are how quantum mechanics are calculated. This is the wave function right here, psi x, and contains two components for most probability waves. Negative h Planck constant squared divided by 2m, that's the mass. This is velocity squared. Well, the velocity vector squared. No. Okay, that's a very, it's, hmm. Okay, that's actually, it's been so long since I've encountered that. But it's a derivative of the wave function that grants a scalar. And then that's the potential, which is pretty much a potential scalar function multiplied by the wave function, which is also scalar, because there are vector functions. And this has to, is the magnitude of the wave function. Absolute value squared is the way to represent that. For reasons of convenience, the total magnitude of a wave function equals 1. So that the magnitude at any point is the probability that you find the particle at that point. Another wave function appears. That's a Calabi Yao manifold. It's a very specific way to get dimensions to get. It's a very specific shape within geometry and part of, and topography. This one specifically has three holes, which is and hole count is an important part of topography, and six compactified dimensions. The reason why they're important in physics is because one of the possible ways in which we're trying to combine general relativity with quantum physics is string theory. And in order for string theory to work properly, you need more dimensions than just the four the universe is made of. 
as far as we can tell. So how do you get a universe with a lot of dimensions, but only a few ones that we can see? And the way to do that is called compactified dimensions. The way, this is the way you can visualize this is that at every possible point in space, you have this little shape. Allowing for more freedom of movement for really tiny things, while having very little, well, much less freedom of movement for massive objects. The way to, a good way to really view compactification is to take a pencil or a hose or some other long cylindrical object that's very thin. From up close, you can say that you can trace a circle around it, and it has t a two-dimensional surface. However, once you move it far away enough, so close up, this is obviously a, you know, a cylinder that you can see and you can move. If you get far away enough, it looks like a line with only one dimension, and that is a compactified dimension. It's so it's small enough so that from large enough distances, you can't really see it. And these Calabi-Yau manifolds would be extremely tiny, so tiny that uh, a proton would be too large to interact with those. That's hyperbolic space. Uh, the way it works is that um, from a outside perspective, it's finite. You can come encase it in a circle. However, from inside, at, distances increase as you approach the circle. So it's infinite in actual size on the inside, if you were inside the actual space. It's absolutely a mathematical concept. <laughs> but physics and math are very closely intertwined. An einstein rosen bridge is a wormhole. It's a path outside of the normal confines of space and goes through the anti de Sitter space to connect two points from in a much shorter distance, probably, not necessarily, than would otherwise be the case. And interestingly enough, you can actually affect the two mouths of the wormhole via time dilation effects to create a time machine. Allowing you to travel through time in weird ways, not just space. Those are strings. String theory is built around them. And the properties of the particles that they generate are based on their vibrations. And length. Quantum entanglement is a concept where two particles can share the same state in which they act, if you observe one, then you know the state of the other. Or an object can have two states at the same time, two closely linked states. Not to be confused with superposition, which is similar on that left front. This is a typical cylinder. It's one of the ways in which a time machine can be built. Now, you need to have a long cylinder, very long. In fact, the length has to be infinite. And it has to be reasonably massive too, multiple stars. And it also has to rotate quickly. With that, it will drag space around it and allow for something called closed time-like curves. 
to explain. Remember the time cone concept with the diag with the forward and left. Under certain circumstances, specifically bent space time, these cones can be tilted. So near a black hole's event horizon, your cone will actually be tilted towards the event horizon, your future light cone. Your past light cone will be tilted away. With enough bending of space and time, you can actually get it so that the cone can become horizontal. At that point, light can actually move in a curve in a circle, never actually changing in time, but still moving in space. And then it could go even further. Eventually, you can get it to the point where it's perfectly, where at high enough speeds, you can move backwards in time or stay within that time frame, creating something called a closed time-like curve. In other words, you can move at a reasonable speed of less than the speed of light, and yet move backwards in time or maintain your current position in time relative to the rest of the universe. And the cylinder is one way to achieve that. Of course, you need to build something of infinite length to manage that. Dang it, I just missed the frame. Hawking radiation occurs at the event horizon, so this is actually the wrong place to put this. But um, part of the quantum foam of space is that particle and antiparticle pairs are constantly created and annihilated. However, at the event horizon, there's a chance for one of the particles to fall into the black hole and the other to escape breaking that system of constant, well, that cycle of constant creation and annihilation, which means energy is suddenly created out of nothing, right? Wrong. Energy and mass must be conserved, so the black hole loses mass equal to that escaping particle. This effect becomes more dramatic as the gradient of space increases, which occurs around smaller black holes, so the smaller the black hole, the faster it radiates away. This effect is tiny, though, so it takes a very long time to occur. Those are different variants of string theory. My first instinct on that when seeing the type 1 and the type 2a was supernovae, but it's actually different variants of string theory. There are six displayed here, for good reason. Um, there was a tricky equation within string theory that um, is difficult to go through. However, it turns to zero if you have 10 dimensions. So everyone assumed that it was nine space dimensions plus one time dimension for string theory to work. This, the reason why there's one time dimension is that multiple time dimensions tend to get weird. So again, convenience. However, this led to five different groupings of string theory that are similar, but mutually exclusive. Type one, Type 2, A, type 2, B, and the, the ones that I don't quite remember. I believe they're the heterogeneous string theories. The sixth one happens to be something called M-theory, which expands to 11 
dimensions in total and includes new things. Some string theory, some of the original string theories had closed and open strings, some only had closed strings, only open strings, etc. M theory has both. And also a new concept called brains, which are short for membranes, and have can have any number of dimensions. Strings are one-dimensional brains, whereas you can have sheets, which are two brains, um, spaces, I guess, like we think of, three brains, etc., all the way up to ten. Additionally, if you, matter, if you try to simplify M theory down to 10 dimensions, like the other string theories, you get one of the five string theory types, depending on, your, on the assumptions and methods that you use to do that. So it was the thing that saved string theory, basically. And that is the end of the video. And there we are. It didn't get everything right. Not absolutely everything. For example, Hawking radiation being in the wrong place. But it was, and it didn't explain what the type one, type two B were. But it was quite excellent. So, uh, um, excluding special circumstances like this, I'll be going back to my usual content after this video. Which, uh, assuming that I'm releasing this Sunday, I'll be back on Monday with my usual content. And I'll see you then.